I can talk now? Awesome. Um, yeah, how to train your Snapdragon. Uh, a lot of data, so we're gonna try to jump real quick. Um, but first, uh, sorry about this, I'm gonna go divergent for about two minutes. Um, if you know or don't know, I pulled out of RSA. Uh, after the allegations, I read Joseph Min's paper, or report, uh, thought about it for about three minutes, uh, and then pulled. Um, I wanted to speak to that very briefly solely because I'm tired of being asked by everyone individually, and I'm tired of being grouped with everyone else that made that decision. Um, to me, I look at crypto, and I think you've got one job, and that's security. And security is built on trust. And if you've done anything to break that, I no longer want to support you. Um, that was my mentality of breaking away from them. I did not want to loan my name, my credibility, my research, anything else to that. Um, that was the only reason I pulled, and it was a respectful reason, um, and they were very cool with me doing it. Uh, and I have no ill will towards the people that work there, uh, just the overall company. Um, having said that, being nice, now it's time to troll, so I have my troll shirt. Um, so, enough BS, let's get in the actual fun stuff. Um, oh, yes. Um, is anyone going to RSA? Really? No one? Does anyone want a t-shirt anyway? Like, come on. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, anyone here from Qualcomm or Sony? I kind of know this answer. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I'll be nice. So, I'm Monk Dot on Twitter. Uh, I break things. I really like to research stuff. I'm a recovering software guy. I uh, wrote AI and crypto for a long time. Got into mobile, did some stuff. Um, left the .gov, .mil, .whatever you want to call it area. Came public. Really like doing research publicly. My goal is to point out things that we can fix if we just looked at them um, and kind of try to be public about maybe making the world slightly a better place. Um, the kernel is my happy place, and if you've never seen me talk before, I really like putting trite commentary on pictures. Um, I don't like a whole bunch of source and text in my stuff. Um, I'm gonna rush through a whole bunch of things, and then whatever anyone wants, we can dig into the source as long as I have time on stage, because we've got a ton of it. Um, <coughs> and aside about rootkits, because that's really what this type of gear can be used for that we're gonna talk about today. Um, Rootkits and malware are kind of boring unless you go state-sponsored, at which they get fascinating for academics and people like me that like to poke at things. Um, my goal to make anything I release not usable as government-sponsored, state-sponsored malware and rootkits is to open source it and throw it on GitHub. Everything that I'm going to talk about today is there. Please have fun. Um, if it's out there in the public, hopefully it's not weaponizable because we all know it's there and we all look for it. Uh, yeah, and I found all these on Google Image, so uh, I don't own anything. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple things today. Story one is going to be about hacking assumptive design. Uh, then we'll go into actual universal exploitation and then roll into hardware in general being unsafe. So one thing I've noticed over the past three or four years, uh, especially, I tear into a lot of Android phones. Um, you see in the software world, it used to be kind of this, you got out of school and then you become an apprentice and you actually, then you get in a company and you find a mentor and you learn how to actually code. That's great. Um, we've kind of broken that chain over the past five or six, seven years in InfoSec by saying, hey, stop doing it the way your mentor did because he did insecure things and now we've learned better. Uh, that's awesome. Yay, software people. Hardware people, not so much. Um, they still follow the same mentality that they're their mentors learned and their mentors learned, so you have generational bad ideas still getting put into to hardware. Um, and there's very little that we can do to stop that, other than say, please, not everything you learned was correct. Um, start questioning the things that you take for granted. If you're going to write software and put it on a device, maybe question how that device works. Look at it a little bit. Hardware's not scary. Um, Science is hard, I'm gonna gloss over things. Uh, if you know them better than me, please be respectful that I'm trying to shorten six months of research into 45 minutes. Um, so finally on to content, yay. Um, 
like I said, when you hardware, anything you do in hardware, SCADA, uh, cell phones, things like this, um, you're inheriting someone else's code. You're inheriting someone else's assumptions. It's not magic, you just kind of have to poke around and realize that hardware designers are software people too. They're lazy, they take shortcuts, they do things. They may not get security. It may not be in their business model to get security. They may get one type of security very good, but not another. Um, my job as an attacker is much, much easier. I don't have to get through everything they've done, I just have to find the thing they did wrong, right? That's what we're all good at and that's why we're here. Um, poking at Android and specifically, or really just cell phones, but Android's easier to poke at, um, brand names become very irrelevant very quick to me in my research. Um, Qualcomm makes socks, I think they've got 60 or 70% of the market share for Android phones. Uh, when you start looking at the baseband, You've got like a 97% global market, or 95, I don't know, it's, it's really high, very impressive. They do a good job. Um, one of the reasons they have such a high market share, well, yes, one of the reasons they have such a high market share is they really try to get customers to put their, you know, mass produce phones with their chip in them. This makes sense, it's a good business move. Um, the phone we're gonna be picking out a lot today is the Sony Xperia Z, uh, picked for no reason other than the fact that some of the other manufacturers I was under NDA, so I picked a company I've never worked with um, and then verified it privately on companies I couldn't get up on stage with. Um, this is what it looks like when you take it apart. It's got an S4 Pro that runs inside of it, which is a Snapdragon. Um, the Moto X and the Nexus 4 also run that same chip. The sister chip is the S4 Plus. Here's some more high-end phones that you may have in your pocket. Oh, there's another sister chip with some more, and then Qualcomm's newest, shiniest, with the newest, shiniest phones on the market today. All these things are a common platform. You're talking about an iterative chip design. You're talking about a full iterative SOC. So it's a system on chip. It has everything you want to build a cell phone. You slap it on a PCB with some microphones and a screen, and you go to market, and you sell a whole bunch of money and retire. Um, that is the goal. That's what Qualcomm wants you to do. Um, and they're very good at it, and they make a great product that does that. One way they get so much market share is they make it very easy to develop a product. You're like, I want to build a phone. I've never built anything. Qualcomm, how do I do this? Qualcomm's like, we have a reference platform. This reference platform is a smartphone. Um, it's really cool. It's actually kind of thick and clunky. It's not something you'd ever want to sell. Um, but it is a full reference platform of what a cell phone should be like. From the, the mouth of God says, ye shall build a cell phone that looks like this, and that's, that's what everyone does. Everyone takes that, um, and everything I've torn apart roughly has these specs, you know? I mean, it, it's logical that if someone starts your process to explain how to do this hard engineering thing of building a phone, you're gonna follow their, their guide. You may do a couple things different, but for the most part, every phone you buy is heavily derivative of that reference platform. Um, so I wanted to buy one, and I tried to buy one through B-Square, which sells them, and Qualcomm has a link on their website. And I got this nice email back saying, you're a security researcher, you're gonna invalidate all of the NDAs that we want you to sign, sorry. Um, so I went to eBay, and I bought things, because the internet wins. Um, <laughs> Since then, and after being very public, I finally got to talk to people at Qualcomm that I actually really like, so I'm going to be a little nicer than I may have been six months ago. Um, but they hooked me up with some links that I have never figured out if they're kosher to share or not, so ask me after. Um, but there are other places to buy it that don't make you sign an NDA. Um, I haven't gone that route because I get all mine off eBay. Um, but in general, this is a good place to start your research if you want to know more about Android. Um, so this is what I do for a living. I take phones apart. That's a phone, that's a phone, that's a phone. Here's my desk with a bunch of phones. Here's a close-up. When I'm done with those phones, I put them in that pink box. Um, when that pink box fills up, I move it, I get another pink box, and I have more phones. I, this is what I do. I take every single new smartphone apart, I look at it, I look for similarities, I try to figure out how they work, and what is quirky about that device that we can play with. Um, that's my world and Domo Kun is gonna help us uh, look at the rest of the thing. Which is basically the dev platform, because everything's derivative, so let's exploit that at a hardware level. If we can do that, 
then my lazy ass has exploited all of the phones, not just a vendor, which is a little, a little cooler. So hardware, uh, finally into the content that you're sitting here for. My hypothesis a year ago, um, and I proposed this to Mudge when he was at DARPA and he funded me through Cyber Fast Track and I was very thankful, was assuming I'm root, which, you know, okay, someone else burns an O-Day and I'm root on a phone. Assuming I have that, I think I can control the voltage that goes from the battery to everywhere. What can I do with that? My big question and why I called it burner was, can I actually catch a phone on fire or can I break it physically? Um, there's a couple different use cases for that, but it would be really interesting if I had a phone that lost, that I lost possession of, that I didn't want anyone else to get the data off. Yeah, I could do a remote wipe, but if they go into airplane mode, I can't contact it to do that. Um, what if I could do something that even a forensics lab couldn't get my data off? That'd be kind of cool. That was really my goal. Um, and I, I thought I could pull it off with just voltage, and I can not as flashy as maybe you would like to see on stage, but the answer is yes. Um, or maybe it is as flashy, I'm not sure, we'll see. So, kind of logic analysis through this. We have a battery in the phone, it stores power, it distributes power over the PCB that's in the phone, there's traces from the battery that go to this thing called a PMIC, that PMIC is a power modulation IC, it pushes power where you tell it to push power. It's very simple, it's very dumb, um, this is not rocket science, this is how EE works. Um, so this PMIC is very silly, and if something says push three volts down that line, the PMIC goes, do I have three volts? Actually, no, it didn't even ask. It just goes, yes, I will push three volts down that line. Um, so if there's three volts that it can push, that's what it's going to do. Um, if there are no capacitors and resistors on that trace to make sure you don't push three volts when you're not supposed to, it's going to push three volts and they're going to get there. That's the end of my talk. Um, <laughs> uh, we're gonna have fun with this, but that's, that's what you're gonna take away. Um, so how do you do that if I'm root, right? We'll start looking in the kernel source. Uh, thankfully, it's all open source and really easy. And it's very well documented. It's well documented because the Android kernel is the Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel is still built for computers that you can take apart and slap other hardware in. Because of that, it has to dynamically be able to manage power um, that's coming from a power source going to hardware that needs power. Um, you start trying to figure out how drivers and stuff like that work, and it's a lot of reading and digging and grepping, and you come up with this whole regulator um, system, which I've found very interesting and it was really easy to manipulate and very, very well documented because writing drivers are hard, you'd like to document so people don't screw it up. Um, I did all this research blind and by that I mean I changed that regulator, I compiled, I loaded it on a phone, I saw what, I, what it did, I made adjustments to my code, I hit compile, I loaded it on a phone, I saw what it did. Um, all blind because Qualcomm does not really share specs for their products at all. Um, they're very tight-lipped, that's how the company works, and that's their mantra, and um, judge them as you will. I respect that they don't want their things leaked, so I wanted to get up on stage and talk about this, I did it blind. If you're interested in continuing this research, though, uh, a couple of Google searches for whatever chip you're actually looking at may find, you may actually find your way to a tarball with like two gigs of internal docs that would have made this research a lot, lot easier. Um, but I didn't want to use that. Um, but having said that, if I was doing this research privately, I would do it a lot differently than I did blind. Um, but again, even blind, so this is me for six months, what can we do with power, the really slow way of hitting compile and loading it on a phone? Assuming we have an unlimited phone someone else is buying. The first thing that you're gonna run into is thermal regulator. When you push more power to something, it's going to get hot. The thermal regulator runs in the phone. There's actually a couple different sensors and a daemon. They realize that it's getting too hot and they shut the phone down. Um, they'll shut processes down and then the phone down. It's kind of like a watchdog for heat. Um, that's cool because you just start looking around and you find out where it's getting power. You can actually just kill the power to those thermal uh, sensors, which kind of works, but so much of runtime Linux is using that thermal daemon that you actually don't want to kill power to that. Um, I tried to overvolt it and fry it just to see what would happen. 
Um, and if you overvolt it, uh, you just get unstable and you crash and it sucks and it's boring. Um, if you slightly tweak the power going to that instead, you can kind of, I could never control it, but you can definitely manipulate how that thermal sensor reads temperature data. Um, so just by maybe giving it a little too or a little less current than it's expecting, you can change how that sensor actually works, um, which was surprising, uh, but that's what I found. I was never able to actually control it enough to make it useful. I didn't spend more than a week on it. Um, but for our cases, for the rest of this talk, we don't want to kill it. We want to let Thermal D run. But we want to make sure that Thermal D doesn't actually do anything but acknowledge that we're getting hot. Because there's a lot of things that check that. You can't really just shut that process down and have the phone run. But in code, it's just got, if I hit this temperature, shut down. If I have this temperature, reboot. If I hit this temperature, really hard reboot. Um, all you have to do is raise those temperatures. So I think my phone would let itself get up to 6.6 .6 million degrees before it would turn off. Um, and that didn't int overflow, and so I had to lower it down. But I mean, it was still ridiculously high. It was never going to get that hot. Um, so with that, now we have a lot of the mitigations that we can control through software out of the way. Um, so the first thing, of course, like we're talking about Qualcomm, so let's break the actual sock itself. Let's just throw an ungodly amount of voltage to that thing and see what it does. Um, going through the front door was a research veil, I'll admit it. Um, the sock that I'm targeting had uh, either two or four crate cores um, that are basically no cores inside the processor. Each one of those I tried to target individually and collectively. Um, Going through the front door, Qualcomm is very good at power management. There um, appears to be a PMIC that's actually internal to the SOC that also regulates a lot of that. It's uh, internal to the SOC. They do have uh, capacitors and resistors, apparently, that keep a lot of this abuse going. There's a window because you can overclock it, so you can do some things, but the extreme, just like I want to put, you know, I think the original thing, when you overclock, you give a lot of times you either give more or less voltage, that's how you get it. So the first time I think I just tried to write code that overclocked to like 6.66 gigahertz, um, it's gonna be a theme of numbers. Uh, it couldn't hit that high, but it also got really hot and then shut off. Um, no matter how I tweaked that, I could never actually get the crates to really fail. So as an aside note, whenever you look online at how do I overclock and what should I do, you always find that guy on the internet that's like, if you overclock your thing, it's gonna catch on fire. That dude's a liar, right? Because that's what I was trying to do. I had funding to do it, and I really couldn't. Um, Qualcomm did a good job there. Um, but that pissed me off. So I wanted to break it, because someone was buying me phones. Um, I figured out that you can kill the USB stack. Um, or you can just say, don't trust anything from the USB stack. You can do that through software really easily by giving it no voltage. Um, that's cool because without voltage, it can't actually accept voltage from the wall and it can't charge the battery. So basically, now you've put your phone into a box um, with no ability to get more power. Um, then I did an extreme overclock. This burns the battery very, 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 very fast. Um, so in about 10 to 20 minutes on average for the two Sonys that I did this on, I was able to run the battery from 100% down to zero. Um, horribly unstable, you couldn't actually use the OS. Um, everything you did would crash it because it was just in a horribly unstable position, leaking power like crazy. Um, they get hot, but not hot enough to catch fire, maybe slightly uncomfortable in your hand is all. Um, you know, if it was in your pocket, you would notice it, let's put it that way. Um, but once they got to zero, um, there's still the kernel, and the way I was doing it on this, the kernel and everything subkernel still had that USB getting zero power. So you couldn't actually charge it again. And I just figured I could, you know, let it go down and the hardware would let it charge itself. It did not. So unintentionally, I bricked a phone. Um, kind of unintentionally, I'm gonna give myself half a point for that in Qualcomm One, because they kept me from going through the front door. Uh, so going through that front door, kind of didn't work all as well as I was hoping. Um, 
but I've done NAND research and I'm happy with NAND, it's another happy place, so it's like, I'm gonna attack that. Um, and this, this, every single phase of this project was basically reading from top to bottom on that regulator file going, what regulators can I play with? Okay, what does that do? That's what I'm gonna spend this week on. Um, and you just ran through the whole file that we'll look at at the end. But um, NAND, I saw this thing called the MSN 7X00A. Uh, it's this weird piece of hardware that from everything I can gather online sits um, outside the sock and the power flows through and it either powers an SD card reader if it's there or the NAND or both. I'm like, ooh, that's cool because you're actually controlling power to anything that's going to use memory. What happens if I poke at it? Um, and so my first poke, and these values are extreme, um, you actually have to be a little more subtle to make this really work, but let's just double the voltage. So this is a line from regulator and uh, it's just a diff. So that 2950000 basically means 2.95 volts running. So I took that line out and I added double that basically. Try to push that, the battery actually doesn't quite have that much power that it can push, but it pushes as much as it has. So now anytime you try to use NAND, you're using double the power. Um, the phones I was playing with really didn't have protection against that in the variants of the PCBs I was using. Um, so every time you actually tried to read from NAND, it corrupted NAND because NAND was getting too much voltage for that and it didn't like it. Um, every time you tried to write, it really corrupted NAND because NAND's kind of fragile and it doesn't really like a lot of excess power. So by doubling the voltage, I was able to kill NAND um, on a reboot those PMIC values that we had set stayed um, until the kernel corrects them, it trusted what the kernel did. So on reboot, it tried to read basically everything that was on the drive and because it was doubling the voltage, it corrupted everything on the drive. So I had basically a brick. Um, yay, that's the first thing I wanted, but it wasn't quite as cool as I wanted. Um, so I halved the voltage instead of curiosity to see what that would do. Um, Going a little more, when you half the voltage, you can actually still read. Um, NAND is, is fairly easy to read at, at, at EE levels, so you can do that. Um, but writing is awkward because it doesn't actually have enough power to write. Uh, it's a harder operation. So in essence, by tweaking the voltage and lowering it considerably, um, we've put a write blocker on a phone remotely, which is kind of cool. Um, there's a lot of things I guess you could do with that, but basically it's a phone frozen in time until you up the voltage again. Um, this I was able to do numerous times in my lab. I think I've got like eight phones that work this way. Um, I talked to the Qualcomm guys and we've been fighting to get them to reproduce my same results, which is like a researcher's nightmare, right? Um, because I'm the only one that seems to be able to do it. So if you want to poke at this, please um, help me verify this bug. Because if this is a bug, it could be easily fixed. We just need someone other than me to actually do the work. DARPA verified the work and they got it, but that's not necessarily public and not necessarily helpful. Um, you know, if, if we can prove that it's a problem, we can then throw resistors and caps in there and probably solve a lot of that problem, or at least shrink the space of, of worry. But for the sake of the slides, we don't really care. Two phones down, um, Qualcomm scores a one, and I got a 1.5 because I killed the phone. Um, Attacking Wi-Fi, like I said, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of these and we can hit code for whatever you're interested in if you care. Um, Wi-Fi is built into the sock. Uh, so at first I was like, well, going through the front door of the sock was really hard, that's not going to work. Started looking at it a little more. Uh, yes, it's BGA in the sock, but it actually has separate pins, so maybe we've got a chance. Um, uh, scanning through the file that we'll look at later. It actually uses three different regulators to push three different types of voltage down depending on how you're using the Wi-Fi chip. Um, and it's got a driver itself that allows for different levels of voltage to go through. So it's a variable voltage device. This is really cool and useful because sometimes you want to boost Wi-Fi signal and sometimes you've got really good signals so you can uh, run in low power mode. It makes sense, but it also means I can tweak at runtime. So I tried and it was protected by the sock very well. I could not fry it. Um, I could tweak the voltage enough to get packets to drop on the floor like crazy or corrupt like crazy. Um, but again, that's like a DOS on a phone. That really wasn't what I was after. So if you're interested in that code, it's in the paper, but um, it was dead to me. Um, USB, interesting. Um, what can we do other than just shutting that whole stack off? Um, and kind of have two things, right? So 
uh, USB was actually really complex. You're actually dealing with PMAX and GPIOs because there's just some controller stuff. Um, but when you start playing with the GPIOs as well, you can start playing with OTG. So now it's like, yay, can I burn my phone or can I burn anything that plugs into my phone? Um, Sony did really good here. There's some other vendors on the market that are very big names in the Android space that don't do as well. Um, and you may be able to find horror stories online about OTG and then put your vendor name in. Um, and this, this is one of the problems that actually sparked this whole research as I knew a vendor that was susceptible but I couldn't uh, publicize that. So I wanted to do a different vendor and damn it, Sony, Sony did it well. Um, but USB overvolting, undervolting, we can corrupt values like crazy so none of the transfers really work. Um, we can disable charging, that was pretty trivial. Um, we can push more voltage over OTG. Uh, my biggest problem here was I couldn't actually find any device that I could plug into OTG that needed power that I could fry. Um, I can push more than it should take, but nothing on the external of that OTG cable was susceptible to dying with too much power. Um, and no fire, I wasn't actually able to break USB. Um, just kill all the data, which is kind of a running theme, right? So we, we are s safe from a pocket fire so far, but we're not safe from uh, a hardware-based DOS, or I guess not really a hardware-based, it's a remote root that does a hardware-based DOS on yourself. Um, it seems like everything can do that, uh, but in Android that's not really hard. Um, so the power plane, if you've ever done EE or design work at all, you'll know uh, you've got a PCB and specific things get voltages through the PMIC and then the PMIC also just drives a big plane of copper, typically on the board, um, in one of the layers that's just reference. So you'll get like you know, 1.2 volts on this whole layer of the PCB and any of the small discrete components can jump in there and get power and don't have to be kernel controlled directly. Um, <coughs> I up that to six volts and I broke three phones, uh, never booted again, but they're discrete components. I have no idea what fried. Um, so I'd kind of like to take credit for that, but I really can't other than it was a dead phone, but um, not targetable control, which is really what I was going for the super sexy. Like I want to just discreetly kill one thing. Um, but we did kill a phone, so I mean, I guess yay. Uh, yeah. Then I started targeting kind of more specific things, like what happens if we target the screen. Um, I can make the screen not work until you reflash a new kernel and then the screen works again. That was kind of sad. Um, the camera, I mean, take a picture and it's all corrupted, which is kind of cool, but you know, it works. Again, couldn't actually fry it. Um, audio hardware can make the mic not work uh, until you flash a new kernel and then it worked again. Uh, the hexagon, which is basically the baseband. Uh, I kind of stayed away from this because Ralph Philip Weinman has done a ton more research than me and um, I knew it was, for the most part, at least on the processor I was using, was pretty much uh, connected to the sock, and I didn't think I'd have a lot of success. So I did kind of a half-assed attempt at it, and yeah, I can make it not work, but it doesn't fry it. Um, but I did get that power plane, so now I've got three points, or two and a half, um, but it successfully did defend it on a bunch, so we're gonna give it four. Um, and we'll get into the real point of you know, this whole research was that battery, right? Uh, going back a couple of years, Charlie Miller gave a talk about trying to get like, rootkits and uh, MacBook batteries, I think is what it was. Uh, but he did a bunch of interesting research. And my question at the time was always like, can I weaponize that and just make the battery blow up, right? That's like just the childish, let's destroy a lot of things. Um, now someone was funding me to do it, so it was awesome. Um, this was really hard. If you want to look at this source code, please don't make me do it on stage. It's about 100 pages that I tried to get here. Um, all of my code's online and I try to document very well. Um, but it's there. Basically, there's a lot of things you have to do that we'll go into in a second, but I can get the battery very, very, very uncomfortably hot. Very uncomfortably hot. Um, very uncomfortably hot. Uh, but I couldn't actually get it to fry, which was kind of a bummer. Um, it's hot enough that, I don't know if you've ever taken phones apart, a lot of the phones, especially the Sony, uh, is designed to be waterproof. So if you want to take it apart, you take like a hair dryer or some hot air gun, and you've got to like run hot air around the whole thing to loosen the glue, and then you can finally pry the screen off and get internal to the phone. Um, but it's pretty beefy glue. It's not like you just have screws to get in. Um, normally with the hair dryer, it takes me like 10 minutes to get into the phone. Or I could let this kernel run and get into the phone in about two minutes 
because it, it gets hot. Um, it's kind of cool, but a little over-engineered just to get into a phone. Um, I let it run overnight in my garage. Basically, the thing would get really hot. It would reboot. It would get really hot. It would reboot. Um, I couldn't keep it stable. There's a lot more protection mechanisms with the battery. They are really worried about this. The PR of batteries exploding in people's pockets that happens accidentally is horrible. Me trying to do it targeted, I've realized that they're actually fairly well protected, not necessarily from attackers that are trying to do it, but just from a not trusting the hardware to behave. They're pretty good there. Um, so the one quirky thing, at least with the Sony, was the battery has a whole system that runs on the battery in the embedded firmware that says, I shall manage my own heat and power. Um, I have a, a thermal sensor. I've got power sensors. I can do this, Colonel, unless you don't want me to. And then I won't. And normally the Colonel just goes, no, battery, you know yourself better than I. You do it. Um, of course, I'm like, no, man, I got this. This is good. Um, but it still kind of defeated me. Um, we were typically able to recover the phone after I let it kind of run all night with my kernel. Um, but it never, ever, ever functioned again. I mean, it would boot, and the screen would kind of, kind of come up, and then it would reboot. And I could get fast boot up enough to flash a new kernel, and that didn't make any more sense. So it was kind of like the power plane. I fried something. Um, this time I fried something internal to the battery, but I have no real idea what I did, um, which is kind of a sciencey person drives me crazy, but um, I cheated and gave myself a point. So now we've got like, they, they're doing really good with seven and I've got three and a half. Um, yeah, but for the battery, we had to turn off all the thermal checking in the battery and the phone. Um, that was difficult. Um, the battery has voltage fail-safes to basically say, like, am I getting too much voltage? Am I getting too much voltage? And you've got to go, no, you're, you're cool. You, you really are designed for 10 volts. Um, and then capacity, you've got to say, no, I know you think you're 100% full, but really you're only 2%. You should continue to fast charge. That's, that's what you need to do. Um, yeah, and then it never reports 100%. Like, I think I, I, I changed the kernel to never realize that it was more than 10% charged. Um, yeah, and it's a hundred page of documentation, or like 80 pages of code on this, I guess, and it's, it's in the doc that is here. Um, so if you want it, all the code and white paper is up, please grab it and ping me. Um, yeah, a little bit more. I'm going to run early, which hopefully we've got questions, or this will just be awkward, me standing up here. Um, so more memes. In general, we tend to want to trust hardware. Um, we tend to want to think that attackers don't get hardware. Hardware's really easy, and at least in Android, it's very, very, very well documented for anyone that likes to read kernel source. It's all out there. Um, it's not hard. Uh, you know, you spend three or four days reading kernel source, and like college comes back to you, and you're like, oh, I remember C. Oh, wait, that's painful. Why did they do that? Um, but it's written to be very multi platform, so it's got to be written in a very. Uh, non-controlling fashion, and it's very non-offensive, very easy code, uh, doesn't really do anything stringent, is really flexible if you want to be mean and make it do things it's not supposed to. So when you're working on products, especially as a software person or doing software-based, worrying about people doing security or popping O-days on software, please um, also realize that I'm probably in your hardware. Um, I can get deeper really easily. Um, I can still do it through software, and then right from software I can get back to hardware. Um, like I said, if you want to continue this, um, don't charge your phone like this, it's bad. Um, it's very bad, do not do it, um, or do it in your garage. Um, but yeah, questions? Um, did I try to attack the microcontroller and the battery? I'm going to just repeat questions. Um, for this, no. I've, I've done a little work on that in the past, and I think it would be, unlike the MacBook battery that was exceedingly difficult, um, that was attempted a couple years ago, I don't really think these things are that complex, so if you can write to them, you're pretty much good. Um, there are mechanisms that I saw in code to let you update that firmware, but it was kind of out of scope, and it felt like cheating. For this, I wanted, really wanted an honest assessment of, 
you know, how much damage could I do on a weekend to the phone in your pocket? Um, so I tried to behave a little bit, but it would be fun to, to do that, that you, you would get a fire that way from everything I've seen. Um, that would be my guess. What's up? No, because it's coupled in the same place as the sock, and that front door was just really hard to get to the GPU as well. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, I would have the same results. I mean, you know, assuming, uh, but I, I, I believe on that platform, I would have the exact same results of either really unstable and you can't actually keep the kernel up, or you can get stability, but you can't actually get enough voltage through to do damage other than corrupting things like crazy. Um, any more? Awkwardly early. What's up? Um, how long did the fails take after loading a kernel? Is that fair? Sure. Okay. Um, so everything, I'll caveat one more time. Everything I did, I did in the kernel with compiles because that's the easiest way to prove a point. Um, a lot of these are dynamically ranged voltages so you can do them. A handful of them you could actually change in runtime um, if you were kernel just through some text files. Uh, but you, know, you can also jump into memory because these things are kind of on a watch jog and change their voltages a little bit. So you could do it runtime. Um, I took the easy way of just compiling kernels. Having said that, I l compile a kernel, I load it on a phone. Normally, if it's going to fry, it fried within the first 30 seconds. Um, it's almost immediate. Like, as soon as the phone got up, um, if I was able to hurt hardware, it hurt it fast and it was dead. I love that question. Um, so he was asking if during the NAND part with reads and writes, did we see anything with the fuses? Um, fuses aren't actually in NAND. Um, fuses are internal to the sock. There's a slab of 16K worth of e-fuses in there. Um, you could fairly trivially probably hit at least the 4K that are exposed, um, but you can just do that directly through ioctals anyway. Um, the other 12K that aren't exposed, I don't know how to target them. Um, but I think there would be easier ways than that. I mean, it's, it's pretty well documented in the kernel source how to write and tweak with those fuses. Um, I'm actually, oddly enough, going to be releasing a tool to do that within the next couple weeks. So um, if you're curious about that, watch GitHub. Um, questions? Um, the closest I got was really with the battery. Um, you know, it got horribly uncomfortable to touch, but that was probably about it. I mean, there was probably more worry of uh, it bubbling and rupturing than it would a fire, because that's just what batteries do. Um, the core processor, I mean, I, you know, again, it was uncomfortable, but um, I couldn't actually get that goal without... Um, something else flammable to start it off with. So. Anything else? Okay, well, I am early. Thank you very much.